Hi, I'm Bill Bentley. With my wife, Ann Wilhelm, we own Wilhelm Farm in North Granby, Connecticut. We are doing some agroforestry work as part of a shifting land use plan for our farm to move it towards permaculture. Two years ago, we began making presentations like this one to various audiences around the Northeast. This presentation was done for the Yale Forest Forum on March 28, 2019, titled The View from Oscar Wilhelm's Farm. I'm going to tell you the story of Wilhelm Farm and Forest, a brief history, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service Conservation Innovation Grant that's funding some of our work on agroforestry. The audiences for our demonstrations are important to understand, but we'll also talk about ecology and soils and land use allocations on our farm and why we are shifting management toward agroforestry and permaculture. Finally, we'll also talk a bit about the household economics perspective that we use. I became forest manager for Oscar Wilhelm's farm when Ann and I purchased the land from her parents in 2003. The Granby area was first settled in the late 1600s, and the town split off from Simsbury in the late 1700s. All the farms in this area were subsistence farms until fairly recently. The acreage that's now Wilhelm Farm was cleared in the early 1800s, and there was a house by the road that could be seen on a town map from about 1820. The house was moved up to the top of the hill where it is now and expanded and barns built during the 1860 to 1890 period. Oscar Wilhelm purchased the farm in 1936 and he moved his wife, Marie, and two sons to North Granby, and they managed the farm until the time we purchased it as a subsistence farm. The farm is 45.6 acres. We'll get into the details of this map at a later slide. But the timeline beginning in 1936 included some intensive work in planting white pine, and fencing pastures in the early years. The forestry operation was so successful that Wilhelm Farm became one of the first 10 tree farms in Connecticut in 1954. In 1962, Marie and Oscar passed away, and Fred and Edith acquired the farm from the estate. 1962 to 2000, Fred and a cousin cut firewood for forestry and improvement. In 1992, the Wilhelm family gave a conservation easement to the Granby Land Trust. This meant that the land can only be used for agricultural and forestry purposes and no development for residential housing. In 1994, Fred commissioned the first forest stewardship plan, which led to his first timber sale in 1997, which included some of those 1936 planted pine. In 2003, Ann and I purchased the farm from Fred and Edith. Subsequent timber sales led to a total of almost half a million board feet being harvested, three quarters of which was in white pine. In 2017, we received the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant for demonstrations of silopasture and other agroforestry systems. The target audiences for our demonstrations are Connecticut rural landowners that own parcels of one or more acres dedicated to either farming or forestry. There are almost 6,000 farm owners, and there are 139,000 forest owners. We're following work done by Mary Terrell with the Yale School of Forestry and Brett Butler with the U.S. Forest Service. Most of these ownerships are families, however structured legally, be it corporate or LLC or sole proprietorships. The 139,000 forest owners hold 
900,000 forest acres. The great bulk of these, 88%, are one to nine acres. Only 1% own 100 plus acres. The right-hand pie chart shows those small ownerships are a little over a third of the forest, and the large ownerships are almost 20%, with the others scattered in between of 10 to 24 acres or 25 to 100 acres. The 6,000 farm owners hold over 400,000 farm acres. A similar pattern is seen with small owners owning very little of the land, the one to nine acres. The largest owners owning a very high percentage of the land, over a third, and then the small owners owning only 2%. So the pattern is the same, the total acres are different. Small ownerships are important to the state of Connecticut and particularly to a town like Granby. The map on the left-hand side is from CLEAR, a University of Connecticut GIS institute that maps over all the state and town by town. As you can see with the dark green, core forest ownerships are very important in Granby and defining the landscape. These core forests provide several public benefits, clean water, air quality, carbon sequestration, reduced soil erosion, wildlife habitat, hydrologic control, and contributions to the economy. We can categorize our Connecticut audiences by their purpose in owning forest land. Woodland retreat people are about 60% of the owners. These people are looking for quiet, solitude, protection of privacy, and enjoyment of nature. The opposite extreme, we have commercial operations, but only 5% of our audience is in this category, but these are people who have to make a profit because they're making their living from the operation. Working the land folks are part of the flow out to basic landscape living during the 1970s. The, many of these folks still remain. Most of these people get their primary income off farm. And we have about a quarter non-resident landowners, some of which are uninvolved, but in Connecticut and in the Northeast in general, non-resident owners are much more involved with their forested landscape that is typical throughout the rest of the United States. It's in part because they don't live too far from their land, but they're very involved in taking care of it, reducing invasive weeds, uh, enjoying it for recreation, and being involved in the communities where those landscapes are owned. We make some summary observations on our audiences. One, the majority are not looking for immediate cash flows or profits. Two, environmental and amenity values are important to all the owners. Wilhelm Farm is typical of Connecticut small farm and forest owners. All small ownerships face uncertain futures because of climate change and volatile weather patterns and rapid change in political, social, and economic context. Our demonstrations are focused on sustainability and resilience within a diverse set of family goals. Looking at Wilhelm Farm over the 1960 to 1980s, it continued as a subsistence farm with off-farm income being critical to the family. The farm provided food and supplemental income to Fred and Edith and their five children, plus relatives and other friends who participated in the farm work and the harvest. As a consequence, a large workforce was available. In 1990, Ann took over the market garden operation and installed a roadside farm stand. There were trade-offs for her doing this. She had reduced income, but she also had reduced expenses of commuting, professional clothing, and so forth. 
a particularly important expense that was not incurred was taking care of our young boys. There were tax advantages as well. By operating a commercial farming operation, we were able to file a Schedule F and take expense for barn roofs, fences, and other investments in the landscape. Most critical to us were the intangibles, taking care of the children, providing work for them, and living in the ambiance of an operating farm. Anne likes the metaphor of the fox and the hedgehog. The hedgehog does one thing very, very well, whereas foxes are opportunistic. And that is what we must be as we have moved to a new transition from a time of having lots of labor available to being dependent on the labor that she and I can offer to the farming operation. During this, we have three goals. Economically, Wilhelm Farm must break even over time. Socially, we want to continue being a community resource as Wilhelm Farm has been since 1936. Environmentally, Wilhelm Farm will be managed to mitigate effects of climate change and be a demonstration to other small ownerships in Granby and elsewhere in Connecticut. Our macro and policy views are based on two resources. The first is a New England food vision, which looked for healthy food for all, sustainable farming and fishing that would provide the large majority of food for the Northeast region, and thriving communities. The community resiliency and sustainability are common to both this vision and to wildlands and woodlands, a vision for the New England landscape. Originally done by the Harvard Forest Team, it envisions 70% of New England in forest, 7% of New England in farmland. 90% of the forest is sustainably managed for timber and other commercial values, recreation, wildlife, and so forth. 10% of the forest land would be conserved as wildlands to protect biodiversity and wilderness. Our household economics perspective is important to understand. A current normative environmental perspective starts with environmental integrity being the overarching goal in which everything else is encased or constrained. Human health and well-being are within that, and robust or resilient economy is kind of in the case within all of that. This can be seen as a set of encased circles, as we see on the left. From the family ownership perspective, however, we think that looking at trade-offs where no one goal overarchingly controls everything that goes on is a much more pragmatic and useful way of seeing things. We see social, environment, and economics as co-equal goals. Where they overlap, we have sustainability. We focus on the trade-offs as we look at alternatives, being, okay, what do we give up in the way of economics to achieve more social or more environmental values? What do we give up in the environmental values to achieve more economic or social? And so forth. So trade-offs become the way we are looking at things, not with one goal over every other goal. This is the map again of our farm, the 45.6 acres, the house, barn, garden, hayfields, pastures, so forth, make up a little over eight of these acres. White pine and hardwoods in the front half of the farm, red oak and other hardwoods in that back half. There are about 30 acres, 30 and a half acres of woods or forest, and then we are converting about seven acres into silvopasture and alley cropping units to make up that 45.6 acres. Granitic soils dominate the west side of Mountain Brook on about 15 acres. 
These soils are a product of the Berkshire Shield and support high-quality red oak and sugar maple. The landscape, however, is very steep with a lot of granitic outcrops. The sandy, glacial till, and alluvial soils on the east side of the brook are dominated by hemlock, black birch, and red maple on the alluvial brookside, and the 18 acres of sandy soils, white pine with very high site, 80 to 85, and excellent red oak sites can be managed with group selection that favors natural regeneration and songbird habitat. The songbirds, by the way, are particularly receptive to multi-age, multi-height forests, which provide niches for many different kinds of birds. Five acres of wet pasture and wet low-grade hardwoods are being converted to an integrated silver pasture unit, and we are reallocating the hay fields to lower slope sandy soil areas, or we're reallocating the market garden to a flat area and alley cropping orchards to the steeper and wetter areas. We're going to improve our soil productivity by shifting land uses towards silvopasture and other agroforestry systems. The wet pastures are not producing useful hay or grasses at the present time. Converting them to silvopasture will dry the soils and provide tree-based fodder. The low-value hardwoods going into silvopasture will convert areas that currently are producing primarily brush to areas producing grass with hardwood shade. The steep hay fields going into alley cropping will reduce potential and actual erosion and will also allow us to move excess water off the landscape into storage ponds. Our farm management goals are shifting towards agroforestry and permaculture. The woods provide a base of 35 acres of naturally permanent vegetation, which have been managed for timber and songbird habitat for over 25 years. We have solid experience with hayfield and pasture management, and Anne has degrees in animal science and considerable practical experience on this farm. Our agroforestry systems will increase the ecological and economic productivity of marginal soils and provide a stronger, more resilient base for increased goat operation, which will produce either dairy goats for a local dairy goat operation or meat for cash. We're developing synergistic relationships with that goat dairy. The goat operation provides another base of cash flow, which can be coupled with our specialty vegetables and our periodic timber harvest. The starting point of our permaculture plan is that most of the landscape is in trees or perennial grasses. The shifting of five acres of trees and grass into silver pasture is the biggest change we're making but we're planning the use of alley cropping, windbreaks, and forest farming on two-plus additional acres. Climate change raises some new issues, higher rainfall, more volatile weather, gathering of surface waters, flows, and detachments, shifting land use on steeper areas towards trees, and consolidating hay production on less steep, high-quality soils. The map on the right side of the slide shows the changes in land use, the light green being the consolidated hay field, the yellow strips being pollinators, which will increase the productivity of all of our crops, the dark orange or raised beds, which will be extended down that slope, gets terrific morning sun, and then the dark green will be the new market garden area when we get back to doing that. The light tan and light green areas are areas where we're using trees either in alley croppings or in plantations of hybrid poplar to absorb the excess moisture and to reduce erosion. Aldo Leopold was an early Yale forestry graduate. He went on to be the founding father of wildlife management in the United States. He wrote a famous book called Sand County Almanac about where he grew up in Wisconsin. In it, 
he has the following. There are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery, and the other that heat comes from the furnace. Thank you very much for listening.